What's up? How's everybody doing? Holy crud, there is a lot of people in this room today. Anybody look around and think that today? We are moving very quickly towards getting that resolved. I want to let you know that. Tonight at 5 o'clock, we're having a new members meeting, which if you've been coming to North Road for a while, and you're like, you know what, I'm ready to give that church a shot. I want to know what it means to be a member here. Come at 5. I'll answer those questions for you as best I possibly can. And then at 545, we have a members meeting, kind of potluck thing we do in here. Um, and it will last about an hour. And in that hour, we're going to tell you exactly what's going on with the building process, where we at. Oh, you're afraid I'm going to hurt myself? Okay. Where we at are in the loan, in the loan situation, what you're going to be hearing from it, when you're going to see drawings and designs, because all that is coming very quickly. Just so that you know, if we stay on track, this will not be a problem in December or January of next year. We are working right now on about a 21,000 square foot building that will accommodate all of us to give you some perspective. We are in 9,000 square feet total right now as a church. So it would almost uh, double, a little bit over double rather. I flunked math. A uh, little bit over double of what we currently have and would be amazing for us. So um, just kind of keep that in mind. If you want to know information, you're a member, come to that. If you come tonight and join at the new member meeting, stay for the dinner, hang out with us and hear everything that's going on. We will also talk about um, a lot of different things, like all the different things we're doing leading up to Christmas. All right? So if you want to know what's going on at North Road, come tonight, join the family, be a part of us. We'd love to show you. Man! Oh, and I got to tell you one other thing about tonight. I promise it'll be done before the debate. Because who's watching the debate tonight? No one. Did, did you know that they are forecasting that over 80 million people are going to watch the debate? So some of y'all are just dang liars. That's, that's, somebody doesn't want to admit, I want to see what they're going to say to Donald Trump. Can you imagine being Donald Trump right now? Seriously? I would feel like the boy that was in trouble that had to go home and face my parents. Because they are going to ask him such horribly hard questions. Oh, my gosh. It's going to be terrible. So the, anyway, moving on. We are not here to talk politics. We are here to talk God. And so in the last three weeks, we talked about doors and doors that you have in your life. Today, we're going to talk about the final week of doors. And we're going to look um, at a unique way of looking at doors. Um, I showed you the video in the beginning, the I am a Christian video. Because if you'll notice some of the things that it said... It said, I am renewed. I am a new creation. I am his. Man, I am a person that doesn't have to worry about who I am. I belong to Christ. And I think for a lot of us in this room, we believe that. Man, I belong to Christ. I don't wonder where I'm going when I die. I don't wonder what's going to happen to me. I don't have fears. And then there's a portion of us that sit in here, and if we're really being gut level honest with one another, here's what you're probably thinking. I hope that I have done enough <laughs> In my life, that when God looks at me, he'll go, all right, come on, you can come to heaven. I mean, that's kind of how we look at life, and we're like, you know, I don't want to think about it. I'm going to shove it out of my mind. I'm just going to hope that when I get there, that God will take me, right? And I think that that is more times than not what a lot of people in church think. And what I want to do for you today is I want to kind of show you what God thinks about that. And I want to kind of show you how you don't have to feel that way anymore, okay? We're going to cover a lot of crazy stuff today. And I'm going to try to go this quickly but as slowly as I possibly can so that you're not sitting here forever but you're understanding. So here we go. There was a guy, his name was Casey Neistat, that in 2004 decided that he would buy one of the first generation iPods. He bought a five gigabyte iPod for $500. Five gigabyte iPod, does that hold like three songs and a video? I mean, it doesn't even have video, but what are they now? They're like 200 gig, 160 gig, do you even know? 250? They're up there. They're over two? Oh, there we go. So five gigs was like three songs and, you know, like a note or something. But anyway, he buys this thing. He has it for 18 months. He listens to his three songs so much that the, songs, or the, the battery dies down and it will only stay charged for an hour. So he calls iPod up and he says, I want a new, iPhone, a new iPod. Mine broke. And they go, no, your battery's bad and we don't have any way to fix that. And so you just have to buy a new iPod. And Casey Neistat was ticked, man. He was like, this is crazy because that battery is supposed to last. He actually went online and he made the first viral website, which was iPodsDirtyLittleSecret.com and like outed them and made them change the way they do everything because of what he put. But that's not what I'm here to tell you. What I'm here to tell you is this, is he took his iPod before he made iPodsDirtyLittleSecret.com and he split it open and he tried to take a de facto battery, stick it in and make it work. And he ended up destroying his iPod altogether to where it wouldn't work at all. And I say all that to say this, okay? God has placed within everybody 
a purpose and a reason for your existence, okay? He's placed a battery inside of you, which is supposed to be him. And it is our job to accept Christ, activate that battery, and become everything he's created us to be. Some of us, because we need a charge and we don't know how to activate ourselves in Christ, we go all the way through life trying to find different doors that we'll walk through, which will hopefully energize us and distract us from the main thing, which is having to deal with who we are when we die. Do you know why we don't think about that? I I want you to kind of think about this for a moment. Have you ever thought about the fact that whether you want to admit it or not, you are immortal? Have you ever thought about that? Whether you want to admit it or not, you are an immortal person, okay? You will live forever. Your existence will go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, okay? Now, some of you, you may feel different. You may not be a Christian. You may be sitting here today. Somebody drug you here, and you're like, dude, you're full of junk, okay? But I believe that I die in this world, and then I live somewhere else forever. And it is an immortalization inside of me that gives me this I'm going to live forever kind of mentality, and I don't really have to think about what's coming up next. I'm just going to ignore it because I live forever, right? And we live this life like that sometimes to our detriment, There was a guy who died three Sundays ago, four Sundays ago. His name was Jose Fernandez. He was a Cy Young caliber pitcher that pitched for the Miami Marlins. He got in a fight with his girlfriend. Him and two buddies get out on the water, and at like 3 o'clock in the morning, they're driving full speed. They hit an embankment of rocks. They fly out. Some of them hit the rocks. They die, okay? Interesting part about that story is there was a guy named Gustavo Rivera who was the driver of that boat, and his buddy said, Man, do not go out with Jose tonight. You guys are going to get hurt. It's not smart. And he texted them back, dude, don't worry about it. Today is not my time. Why would he write that? Because we are immortal people, because it has been designed in us to live forever, we think we're just going to be okay. We think that everything's going to be all right, that you know what? We don't have an expiration date, but we do. Right? And what I want to help land for you today is I want, to, I want to challenge you to stop trying to find other doors, other batteries to charge yourself with, and to charge yourself with the one battery that will forever allow you not to worry about what your forever looks like ever again. Okay? So if you got your Bibles, I want you to do something with me real quick. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. Pull that up for me real quick. Okay? And if you don't have a Bible, don't worry about it. You can look at it on the screen. Wisest dude that ever walked the earth wrote this statement. It is better to go to funerals, is basically what that says, the house of mourning. It is better to go to funerals than go to weddings, than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. My dad used to say this to me all the time when I was a kid. Matt, if you want to have a deep relationship with God, it is better to go to funerals than to go to weddings. Because at weddings you celebrate, and you don't think about your mortality, and you don't think about how the fact that this world ends. You just kind of go on, and you're like, hey, it's a party, right? But at a funeral, you sit down, and you begin to contemplate, man, one day I'm going to be the dude in the box. Have I got everything figured out? Have have I laid to rest the fact that I am completely confident that Jesus is my Savior? The wisest man in the world said, hey, you know what? If you're smart, you'll go to more funerals and you'll go to weddings because nothing is more sobering than understanding that this world ends, but eternity doesn't. Right? Philippians 2.12, pull that one up real quick. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, Don't miss this. I really don't want you to miss this. How does God say to work out your salvation? In fear and trembling. All the way through the Bible, God talks more about fear than anything else in the Bible. And you know what he says about it? He says, don't fear. That that contradicts God, doesn't it? If God writes all the way through the Bible, don't fear, and then he writes, hey, work out your salvation with fear, that doesn't make sense. But here's what he's trying to say. With a respect and an understanding, you need to decide every day who you belong to. When I lived in Augusta, Georgia, there was a, we had this church on Sunday nights. We would go out and talk to new people that came to church. They would, there was this lady, she'd make these amazing chocolate chip cookies. I mean, they were the bomb. And she would make them, and then they would take them out to the new visitors. And I would go in the kitchen to make sure, you know, that they wouldn't hurt somebody before they delivered them. And I would eat, you know, like one, two, a dozen. Anyway, I ate my dozen cookies, and you got to have milk with cookies, right? So we had this humongous kitchen in that church. And I pull up in the, in the, pull up in the, uh, the, the 
container or the, freezer, the fridge. That's what I'm thinking of. I pull up in the fridge and I pull out the milk and I see it says the 29th and I lay it on the table and I'm munching cookies and I'm talking to teenagers because at that time I'm a youth pastor and I don't pay any attention. I pour the milk in my glass and I chug it and it is like curdled cottage cheese. It doesn't taste as bad as you would really think it would. I, I was really surprised. I expected it to be much worse, but it was still really nasty. And I looked down. It was March. I'll never forget this. It was March 27th. I saw a 29th on it, and I thought it was March 29th when it went bad, and I had some time, right? Except for I didn't look at the date I, or the, the month. I just looked at the date, and it was February 29th, right? So I drank two-month-old milk. It was nasty, right? Now, why do I tell you that? When God says to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, he's talking about respect. In other words, respect the reality of everyone in this world. Can I tell you something? I don't drink milk anymore without respecting the date. I don't just look at the number. I look at the month, right? And out of respect, if it says February 29th and it's March 27th, there's no way I'm putting that in my mouth, right? Why? Because I'm afraid of it? No, I don't think it's going to kill me. There's not like a, an animal going to come out of it and eat my face off. I, it, if I drink it, it's going to be nasty, right? And so out of respect and understanding, I consider it and I make a decision, okay? So here's what God says. If you want to know him and you want to quit worrying about, have I done enough to get to the end? Number one, you need to really soberly, like going to a funeral, think about, am I connected to God? Number two, Every single day, you need to consider this and go, am I walking as if God was my Lord? Now, what does it look like to walk with God as your Lord? If you got your Bibles, you can do this real quick. Go to John chapter 10, verse 9. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's going to be on the screen, and you can look at it there. We're actually going to start in verse 7. Here's what Jesus says. He goes, so Jesus again said to them, truly I say to you, I am the door. Okay, now we can argue a lot of things. We can argue a lot of different realities of religion, right? But here's one thing. If you believe the Bible to be true, if you believe the Bible is what it is, here's what you're going to find. Jesus says to them, truly I say to you, I am the door. You want to get to God? You come through me, okay? It's understanding who God is. In your walk with God, some of you have been to a hundred different kinds of churches, and you've been told a lot of different things. Go through this class, do this, make this decision, fill out this card, walk to this place, and you'll have God, right? I don't read that in my Bible. Here's what I read. Do you want to have a relationship with Jesus? I am the door. Go through Jesus, right? Look at what he says. And, I, and he talks just exactly about what I just said. Truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me, people who say that they're different ways to God, they are thieves and they are robbers and they're lying to you and they're deceiving you and they're telling you, hey man, it's okay. And what Jesus is saying is, you want to go to heaven, here's what it takes. I am the door. I am the only way. Can I ask you a question? Has there ever been a moment? No, no, let's back up and read it. He does what he doesn't say before I ask you this question. Jesus says, truly I say to you, I am the confirmation class. I am the person that you walk down to in the front and fill out the card with. I am this person. <laughs> it doesn't say any of that. It says, Jesus says, I am the way. I am the door. Okay? So here's my question for you that I was going to ask you before I ask you that. Has there ever been a moment in your life when you submitted your heart, your lordship, to Jesus? Because if not, if there's never been that moment where you said, Jesus, you can have the lordship of my life, I can understand why you sit there and you go, man, I don't know. I have doubts. I hope I get to the end of this thing and I've just figured it out. I remember being a kid and walking through my life and going, man, I remember praying a prayer with a preacher at one point in time. I remember filling out a card, but was it really legit? I remember having those doubts and those wonderments. And it wasn't until I was like 23 years old that God really solidified for me that at age seven, that was real. And some of you guys may be wondering that same thing. We have to understand that Jesus is the door. Now, here, I'm going to show you how to not to wonder that anymore in just a second. But the second thing we got to do is we got to recognize what happens if we don't understand that Jesus is the door. Go to Luke chapter 16, verse 19. It's going to be right up there. Jesus is given a parable, and here's what he says. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen who feasted sumptuously every day. Now, remember, Jesus is given a parable. He's kind of describing world, but it's not a true story, right? It's a, it's a parable. It's a fable. 
Okay, he's describing a guy, if you will, that forever has had an incredible life, who has enjoyed his 70 years here to the fullest, okay? So there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day, and at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed from what fell from the rich man's table. It goes on to tell the story that here's these two guys, the Lazarus goes to heaven and the rich man goes to hell, and the rich man realizing that he's in hell, says, man, Abraham, you've got to send Lazarus to put some water on my tongue. I am struggling down here. And Abraham says this in this story, and Jesus is trying to paint this picture. Jesus is the door, and he goes, rich man, there is an incredibly huge door that has been placed between heaven and hell. That once that door is shut, there's nobody on this side that can open it, and there's nobody on your side that can open it, and that decision has to be made during now. And you have to recognize that. Understand Jesus is the only way. Recognize that decision has to be made now because that door is getting ready to close. And then finally, decide. Now, let me say this real quick. I struggled in this, in this arena of life, just to be honest with you. I gave my life to Jesus when I was seven years old. I remember walking down the aisle and praying the prayer with my dad, Elvis Presley's stepbrother, was leading the service that day, and he was the one that told me how to know Christ. Uh huh. You like that? And uh, I, and I remember at age seven, I remember the the pastor baptizing me, and going through all the religious things that we do. You know, nothing wrong with baptism, but I'm talking about the religious of walk before the pastor, fill out the card, do all that stuff. If you're in my denom, if you grew up like I did, okay. And I remember for years wondering, did I get that right? Did I make that right? Was that was that decision legit? Was it, was it foundational in my life? I, I had those doubts and those worries. I went into ministry my junior year in high school or my senior year in high school, giving my life to Christ and, and still having those doubts. Why did I have those doubts? Because I had never decided in my heart to make Jesus the lordship of my life. I'd given Jesus my life, okay? I said, hey, you can have it. But I didn't understand when I did that. I was seven years old, and I was learning lordship, okay? And I remember going out on White Oak Estates on Highway H on the little deck off the side of my house and screaming at the top of my lungs, God, you can have my life, whatever that means. Only it was a lot louder. And I just screamed it over and over again. God, you can have my life. I surrender to you. You are my Lord. I'm not running anymore. I'm not making my own decisions anymore. What you want from me is what you get from me. And I remember that moment. It was like, <sighs> this peace came over me. And I didn't wonder anymore. Joshua, in the Old Testament, he wrote this. I, I think he had one of those moments. If you, got, if you got your Bibles, if you don't, it's Joshua chapter 24. And he writes this. I want to read it to you before we kind of close this down. Joshua chapter 24. I'm going to get there. That's Judges. One thing that stinks about talking really fast is when you do other things really slow, people go, good grief, dude. <laughs> Joshua chapter 24. Here's what Joshua says. He's talking to the people around him. He goes, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him with sincerity and faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river in the Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil you want, here's what he's writing. I just want to make sure you understand this. And if it's evil you want, go get it. Go after the gods of your fathers and go after the gods of the Amorites. If you want evil, you can have evil. It's right there. Go get it. And then he looks at it and he goes, but as for me and my house, I'm serving God. I'm making him Lord. I'm putting him number one. No more playing these games. No more chasing after other gods. No more putting my job and my family and my wants and my desires and other things in front of him. He is now the lordship of my life. He is number one. That's what Joshua put a line in the sand and said, I'm done playing games. He's number one. Some of you struggle, and I know you struggle. With making Jesus number one. And so because of that, you're like, man, I sure hope I've done enough to make God love me at the end. Number one, you don't have to do enough to make God love you at the end. God loves you when you come to him. Okay? But when you come to him, you must come to him and say, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I realize I can't do this on my own. And so I'm giving you control of it. 
A lot of times what we do in church is we go through these religious motions, but we don't say, Jesus, you can have lordship of my life, right? So we'll say, you can have this and this and this. You can have Sunday morning from 10 to 30, 11.30, and you can have this time at the dinner table when we pray, and you know, I'll give you this little portion of my life, but the rest of this, off limits. You're not touching it. That's not lordship. That's making deals with God, and God doesn't make deals. For years of my life, I made deals with God. And I constantly wondered, does he really own my heart? Until the day I stood on that deck and said, I am done making deals. You can have it. Mahatma Gandhi was the guy in the 1980s that was on NBC News, it seemed like, every night at 6 o'clock because he was starving himself for something else. You remember this, if you were my age? He came up with a statement, a quote, and it's so true. He doesn't even know who God is, but he understands what it means to make something Lord of your life. And here's what he said. Your actions will express your priorities. Let me say that again real clearly. Your actions will express your priorities. For the majority of my childhood, up to about 22 years old, my actions expressed my priorities. I would say, God, oh yeah, I love God. I'm a Christian. I go to church. Yeah, absolutely. But my actions, the other 99.5% of the time, proved that I had not said yet, hey, Jesus, you can have lordship of everything that I am. Right? It was that day on that deck with tears rolling down my face, screaming at the heavens, going, Jesus, from here on out, my actions will represent my priorities. How about you? I think today we sit in three spots in here. Some of us, We've walked this really hard road, you know, and we've gotten to the point where we don't question our walk with God anymore. We know he loves us. We accept that love, and we are excited about the day that we finally meet him. Others of us in here, we're worried. We're not quite sure. You know, we think we did the right thing. We did all this rigmarole religion stuff, and we hope it's right at the end, kind of like where I was at 20 years old. And then there's some of us, there has never been a moment in our life when we've asked Jesus to be the Savior of who we are. Can I tell you what God would like you to know today, if that's you, or the second one? Every single day, you should ask yourself that question until you get it solved. Every single day, you ought to try to go to more funerals than go to weddings, so that you take a sober look at yourself. Because here's what natural tendency is for us to do. Man, I'm good. I'm immortal. I'm good. I'm just going to distract myself. I'm going to go to work. I'm going to get a good house. I'm going to cut my grass. I'm going to go party with my friends. And if I do all these things, I'll just forget that I have to deal with this whole God thing. But the God thing doesn't go away. It's just every single hour that you live, it comes closer and closer and closer. So here's my question. What if today was the beginning of you stopping the wonderment and the worry and the questions? What if today you said, hey, God, as for me, man, you can have lordship of my life. It is yours. I will give it to you, and I will trust you, and I will quit worrying. I'll quit wondering, and I'll start living. Some of you? A while back, you went through this religious thing where you said, hey, Jesus, you can have lordship of my life, but you've held parts of it back. And so you're kind of wondering, well, did I really mean it? You need to give him all those parts. Some of you, like Julian, you said, I'll get saved, but I'm not getting baptized. That's weird, getting dunked in water in front of people. Come on, seriously? That's a lordship issue. That's like me getting on the, on the stage with my wife at our wedding and going, hey, I'll marry you, and I'll say I do, but I ain't putting that ring you bought me on. Oh, really? I mean, she's sitting right back there. She'd probably tell you, That ain't going to (laughs) happen, right? It's the same way with God. God says, hey, you want lordship? You want me to be Lord? Then let me be Lord. And if you don't, then, man, go after evil. The one thing that Joshua said at the very end, he goes, man, if evil is what you want, go get it. You know why he told them to go get it? Because if evil is what you want, you got 70 years at the most to figure, maybe 80, 90 years. Some of you are 70. I just made you feel like you're going to die. Well, let's be honest. I mean, you got 90 to 100 years. Okay, we'll we'll just shoot it high, right? (laughs) Howard turned eight shades of white over there. (laughs) Just kidding, Howard. But I say that to say this, right? I'm not trying to be insulting. trying to make a point. Don't lose focus here. 
What I'm trying to say is if evil is what Josh was saying is if evil is what you want, then use this lifetime to get it because that's where it ends. And then you have to deal with your own immortality. Or you can start right here, giving your life to God and enjoying what it looks like to be a child of his. I don't wonder. I don't worry. And, man, if you look at the inside of my life, do I have problems? Yeah. Do I fall all the time? But, man, I can tell you nine times out of ten, I love my life because of who God is in it. And I wouldn't trade it with anyone because he's changed me and he's made me a better man and he's given me hope. Will you do me a favor? Will you bow your head and close your eyes for just a second? The band's going to come up and going to play. Don't look around right now. Give, give people privacy if you would. But if you're sitting in here right now and you're going, Matt, I wonder all the time if I've done enough that when God sees me, he'll accept me. I, I wonder that. I, I, I have that worry in my life. I can relate to you on that. If that is you, nobody looking around, just lift your hand. Matt, that's me. Okay, awesome. Thanks for your honesty. Anybody else? I'm not here to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I just I want to talk to you here in a minute. If you're sitting in here right now and you say, man, there has never been a moment when I gave my life to Jesus. Never. And I, and I realize I've got to deal with that. I can't ignore it. I can't just act like it's going to go away because it's not. If you're sitting in here right now and you're going, man, I, I need to talk to somebody. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to make you walk forward. You don't have to fill out a card and wave at everybody. You're simply going to go out with me and get a Coke. Or you're going to find, if you're a lady, we're going to set you up with a lady to go out and get a Coke and just talk about what it means to know Jesus. And if you would like to know, man, I need to talk to somebody to know how to know God. Just lift your hand. Matt, that's me. Just lift it up high and leave it there. So I can see it. Awesome. You can put it back down. Anybody else? If you lifted your hand, do me a favor. Look up at me for right now. Only those of you that lifted your hand. Okay? I want to sit down and have that conversation with you. Okay? Can I do that? I want to shore that up for you. You don't have to live that life. You don't have to live that wonderment. You don't have to live in that anguish and that, and that, that fear. God didn't create you to be a person of fear. He loves you. He wants to have a relationship with you that is awesome, and I want to help you find that. Okay? I want to help you find that, and I will. Let me pray for you. Dear Jesus, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for the fact that you had us on your mind before you had anything else. And I pray, God, that you would just penetrate the heart of the people that are in this room and let them know they lo you love them and that, God, your desire for them is to have life. And I ask these things in your name. Amen.